back a year ago. Welcome, everyone, to another episode of the Beer Bound Podcast. In today's episode, we're delighted to be joined by Professor Jeffrey Myron. Jeffrey received a BA magna cum laude from Swarthmore College in 1979 and a PhD in economics from MIT in 1984. Jeffrey currently serves as senior lecturer and director of undergraduate studies in the Department of Economics at Harvard University, as well as vice president of research at the Cato Institute. His field of expertise is the economics of libertarianism. He has advocated for many libertarian policies, including legalizing all drugs and allowing failing banks to go bankrupt. He has written four books, including Drug War Crimes, The Consequences of Prohibition, and Libertarianism from A to Z. Jeffrey also has a new substack entitled Libertarian Land. We will include the URL in the description for this episode. We're excited to speak to Jeffrey and learn more about his personal journey and uh, a little bit about his works to boot. So Jeffrey, welcome to the Beer Bound Podcast. How are you doing today? I'm great. Thank you for having me. Jeffrey, of course, we like to start things off by giving a little introduction, but of course, your academic background and your proficiency and expertise goes quite a bit further. So maybe could you expand a little bit on my simple introduction and tell us a little bit more on your academic background, who you are, and what you do? So I teach economics in the Department of Economics at Harvard University. I run the undergraduate program. I'm director of graduate studies as well. Uh, my interests are in economics of libertarianism, of small government, and I've especially spent a large part of the last 30 years examining the effects of prohibitions like U.S. alcohol prohibition from the 1920s and modern drug prohibition um, and related policies uh, such as sin taxes and minimum purchase ages and prohibitions on all sorts of goods much more generally. And I not just studying it, I advocate for quite actively for legalization, for not prohibiting all these substances based on analyzing the consequences of what happens when you try to get rid of something or reduce the harm from something by outlawing it. My argument is you make things worse. All right. So take us all the way back. What is libertarianism? Obviously, we're well aware of a little bit of polarization, maybe a little bit that exists in your country. <laughs> And often folks refer to conservatives or liberals, folks on the right, folks on the left. But libertarianism, where does that fall in the political spectrum? So first of all, I'm actually a dual Canadian citizen. My mother was born and raised in Windsor, Ontario. So your country and my country overlap to some degree. Uh, but uh, libertarianism is the idea that small government is the best kind of government. How small do we mean? We mean get rid of almost everything adopted since the 90s, the 1790s. So we're not talking about minor tweaks or little adjustments. We're talking about really a radically different vision. So we would get rid of the welfare state, huge amounts of existing regulation, bans on drugs, uh, labor market regulation, uh, many, many, you know, almost everything else. So it would be very, very minimal government. Now, not zero. Libertarians think there's a role for a government in criminal justice enforcement and having police, prisons, prosecutors for those things which really should be crimes like murder, assault, robbery, etc. Not for things that are standard victimless crimes, drugs, prostitution, gambling, and so on. So there would be many fewer laws, but there would be a police and a criminal justice enforcement. And we believe in having a national defense that is focused on defending the country against attack, not on going all around the world, invading other countries, stationing our troops there for 10, 20, 30 years, getting involved in all sorts of local conflicts, but simply being able to defend the country or provide enough deterrence that no one ever tries to uh, invade the country. So it's not zero government, it's small government. And compared to the existing libertarian and sort of conservative views in the US, we are somewhat sympathetic with libertarian with the liberal views on certain issues. Libertarians tend to believe in 
uh, legalizing gay marriage, in relatively open immigration, in limited foreign policy interventions, in legalizing drugs, so social sort of issues. Uh, but we radically disagree with most liberals on a lot of economic regulation types of points. And it's kind of the reverse for conservatives. We are sympathetic to the conservative view that we're spending way too much, taxing way too much, regulating way too much. But we disagree quite strongly with conservatives when they want to have government mandate sort of how people live and dictate a particular vision of what's an acceptable lifestyle and things like that. So obviously you have in the United States, you have a bit of a dichotomy in terms of your political parties, the Republicans and the Democrats. How successful is the libertarian party that exists in the United States? What is it? Does it have any um, does it have any foundation or popularity in this current year of 2023? It has had a small amount of popularity. The, by one measure, the height was in 20. 12 when Gary Johnson uh, ran for the presidency and got 3% of the popular vote. That was by far the most a libertarian presidential candidate had ever received, but it's still 3%. Okay? And it seems to come based on somewhat limited exit polling data, roughly 50-50 from liberals and conservatives, people who would otherwise have voted Republican or Democrat. So it's not clear that it really changed any election outcomes. Uh, but it got a little bit of attention. Libertarians think that we maybe are having successes issue by issue rather than party by party. It's not that we have any chance of convincing the Republicans to be really libertarian or the liberals to be re really libertarian, but maybe we can make common cause with liberals on a few issues, with Republicans on a few issues, and help tilt the balance okay, on those particular points okay, by joining forces with one side or the other. So an example would be marijuana legalization. Okay, that's more of a left issue than a right issue. Um, and there's certainly been progress in scaling back marijuana prohibition in the U.S. Uh, another issue is same-sex marriage. In 1996, Democrats and Republicans were pretty united in passing the Defense of Marriage Act in the U.S., which has absolutely outlawed same-sex marriage. And only 10, 15 years later, it's now legal in every state in the country, um, and for the most part, it's widely accepted sort of throughout the country. Jeffrey, why is libertarianism not, and I don't mean to be rude here, why is it not so successful or sexy in the public eye? Why, doesn't, why does it only, at best, get 3% of the vote during an election year? How come, would you say? Is it a brand issue? Is it a, a marketing failure? Why do Americans not want to bite in terms of of voting for libertarianism, libertarianists? I think it's hard to pin one or two exact reasons, but several things conspire to keep it relatively in the minority. In many situations, people would like to believe that there's a solution, that policy X or policy Y is clearly going to make everything all better. Outlawing drugs will get rid of problems related to drug abuse. The libertarian view is that there are better and worse policies but in most instances, even the better policy has plenty of negative things happening. The public doesn't seem to want to accept that. It seems to want to accept that there's not just policy A, which is bad, and policy B, which is really bad. They want to think there's policy C, which solves all the problems. That's just rarely, rarely the case. Or to the extent it's the case, those have already happened because there was no particular reason for anybody to oppose those. Um, I think that partially as government has gotten bigger, more and more people feel that they need to use government to get ahead. If you were a business, maybe 150 years ago, you could stick to your free market principles because the degree of regulation, government intervention was pretty free market. Nowadays, to get ahead, there are going to be subsidies, taxes, special treatment for one industry versus another or one company versus another. So if you don't get on board and try to influence the legislation in your direction, you're going to have a relatively tough time. Um, and I think third reason is probably a fair number of, I got two more points. The third reason is a fair number of people think of government as they, they want people to be like them and they feel comfortable with the way they live and their sets of values. And it makes them a little nervous if there are very different values or the like 
I happen to like using drugs. You don't. But both of you can say, that's fine. You you do what you do like to do, and I'll do what I like. But they're somehow made uncomfortable by different lifestyles. Okay, The issues related to homosexuality and transgender, I think, illustrate that really well. People are just very uncomfortable with this very different sort of way of living. And so they tend to want to use government to shut down the ways that they're not so comfortable with. That leads you to be a big government person. And libertarians think of conservatives and liberals at some level as the same. They're all big government types. They all want to use government to promote their vision. They happen to have somewhat different visions, but they're similar and completely different from libertarians in thinking that government should play a role in determining which sort of vision. All that said, there are some polls that you could read as saying there's a decent amount of support, way more than 3%, for a soft version of libertarianism. Okay, a version that would scale back drug prohibition and focus more on treatment and less on punitive measures, less on you know, prisons and more on methadone maintenance. There's a scaled back version that would say, yes, regulation in some areas has gotten excessive. So we're going to cut back in a few specific areas, but we're not just going to repeal all regulation passed for the last 100 years. You know, there's a version that says entitlements like Social Security and Medicare they're growing faster than is sustainable. So we need to moderate them, but we still wanna have them just in a somewhat skill. So if you do the right kind of polling, if you ask the questions in the right way, you can get a substantially high fraction of the country to express this kind of soft libertarianism. So maybe we're not so far off and maybe we're having an effect by working issue by issue at keeping government from being a lot bigger than it otherwise would be even though we clearly are not being successful in an electoral sense. We're not winning very many elections outside of local dog catcher or something like that. Well, Jeffrey, obviously there are, if you look at the map of the United States, there's typical patterns between what are referred to, of course, as blue states and red states. And there are some swing states that kind of go back and forth, but there are ones that seem to be pretty consistent yeah. within each passing election year. They typically go Democrat or or Republican, and they there's typically not too much movement on that. Is there any, I don't know what color libertarianists would be, <laughs> red and blue for the, the Democrats and the Republicans, maybe. Purple. Is there a section of the United States geographically that leans a little bit more libertarian? Not especially. Some parts of the West and the Midwest sound somewhat more libertarian. New Hampshire, of course, has had the reputation for being the most libertarian. Their state motto is live free or die. There were movements to create a libertarian city, a libertarian kind of enclave where everyone who moved there would vote in favor of very small government at that city level. Um, but I don't think particularly there's a geographic pattern to it. I could be wrong. Um, for example, New Hampshire, which you might have pointed to as the most libertarian state, is the one state in New England that hasn't legalized marijuana yet. So it doesn't fit very well. Yeah, New Hampshire is kind of weird geographically, isn't it? It's kind of like, it seems like it's in the wrong spot on the map. But <laughs> Maybe. Yeah, interesting. Well, okay, what, then what's the big difference? What's the difference between libertarianism and, say, anarchy? Would it just be that libertarianism has an interest in some form of government where anarchy is absolutely none? Yes, relative to where we currently are, most people will think that the difference between libertarianism and anarchy is kind of irrelevant, is, is, is so tiny as not to be material. But uh, libertarians think government should be playing a role in defining and enforcing property rights. And then it's not quite obvious how purely private arrangements would do that. So you can imagine the cases where private mechanisms could be useful in settling disputes, avoiding violence, um, enforcing property rights. I mean, arbitration is a private dispute resolution mechanism. Okay, so two people have agreed that if there's, a, uh, if there's an employment contract dispute, that it goes to arbitration and you do whatever the arbitrator says. But imagine you do that and then one side or the other in this arbitration says, you know what? I know I agreed I'd abide by the settlement, but I don't like the decision of the arbitrator, so I'm just not going to pay up. Well, then that's the whole thing sort of breaks down. Okay, Maybe reputational mechanisms could help 
make it work, but not seamlessly. So there somehow has to be a government at the end of the chain that says, no, if you enter into this arbitration agreement and then you violate it, you can be sued and the government will enforce the lawsuit against you for violating not living up to the arbitration agreement. So I, I would be happy to be convinced that the right amount of government was zero, but I'm not convinced. I think it's very small, but not zero. Jeffrey, I, I have a, a bit of a personal question. I'll ask it anyway. Do you, and I don't mean to be condescending, do you actually adhere to all of the attributes that you attribute to libertarianism? Or is a lot of it academic fascination that you delve into? Or are you, in your own personal sense of of political ideology, do you lean straight towards libertarianism? I think I'm quite consistent. I'll give you one illustration, which is that all sorts of organizations have lots of rules. My university has billions of rules about qualifying for a degree and all that stuff. And it's not exactly a libertarian issue because libertarianism is about government policies, not privately adopted policies. Libertarians would defend any university's right to have whatever cockamamie policies it wants, so long as no one is coerced to go to that university or live by those policies. Nevertheless, okay, when a university adopts a strict policy, some of the exact same things happen as happened when governments adopt strict policies, which is some people ignore them, some people get confused by them, you waste resources trying to enforce them, and the objectives of the policy were never entirely sort of convincing in the first place. And so I'm on various committees in the university where I'm always arguing against more policies. And I actually get, you know, emails or messages in the chat room that says, yeah, you know, libertarians kind of have the right instinct on this one if someone agrees with me that this policy. So I think I'm consistent in that way. And I don't necessarily vote libertarian because First of all, voting generally at some level is irrational because no one person can affect the outcome except in, you know, an infinitesimal probability. But I'm much more concerned about divided government. I don't trust either side, either major party. I want to vote so that, say, the governor is one party and the legislature is the other, or Congress is one party and the president is the other, in hopes that they disagree enough that not too much new crazy stuff happens. So. And that's between them. <laughs> yeah, that's actually pretty strategic. So keep it. <laughs> I mean, it, it kind of again, has no effect because no one person's vote matters. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Interesting. I guess my, my question kind of came from, well, you live in a pretty, I would say, a pretty progressive city and you work at a at quite a <laughs> liberal academic institution. So I would think maybe that you're a little bit of a black sheep in your community. Would that be suffice to say? Not real. I mean, it's it, it's a totally sensible hypothesis, but it doesn't seem to turn out that way. So I teach a course to undergraduates that gets 250, 300 students in a typical year. Uh, it's a, it gets very good ratings. It's quite popular. And I teach the down the line libertarian position on all the sort of issues on, you know, racial differences, on national defense, on economic regulation, on redistribution, on marriage, on drugs, on guns. And you would think that I would have been canceled long ago if you believe, say, the Wall Street Journal characterization of you know wokeness on campus and stuff like that. No one has ever said a word to me. I've never been, you know, vilified in the in the student newspaper called the Crimson. Um, and people seem to get along with me fine. They don't seem to, I mean, people seem to be aware. I get, I get, you know, ribbed about it. I get jokes, but I don't feel like I get anything unpleasant and certainly nothing that tries to cancel me. Now, partly it's because true libertarianism really does endorse the liberal perspective, even out liberals the liberals to a significant degree on some issues like immigration. You know, liberals historically have been kind of mushy on immigration. On the one hand, they sort of say positive things about it. On the other hand, one of their constituencies is labor unions who are not so thrilled about some forms of immigration, whereas liberals are pretty much open borders or at least something very close to open borders. And 
I libertarian view was strongly pro legalization of same sex marriage for legalizing drugs against the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq. So what's a liberal going to disagree with about any of those positions? You know, exactly the liberal positions. Um, now, of course, we disagree. I disagree with a large fraction of my colleagues about the minimum wage, about some kinds of environmental regulation and so on. And so, but first of all, that's pretty much straight economics. So they're willing to sort of a little teeny bit concede, look, economists are allowed to have opinions on economics. <laughs> that is their, you know, just like the English professors allowed to have their opinions on Shakespeare. That's kind of, and I think also you just have to do it. The, the, the Wall Street Journal doesn't give academics enough credit for the fact that they like to argue. If you're making rational arguments, if you're trying to discuss evidence, and if you're reasonable and polite, you're not yelling and screaming, you're just being calm and debating. Academics love that. That's a lot of why people became academics. So I don't, I don't never felt any tension or issue about that. Hmm. Fascinating. I guess maybe I really want to get into your, your knowledge and expertise on prohibition and drugs, but I do have a question about, well, what about, it's true that maybe the more liberal progressive side is is open to a lot more ideas of such topics as same-sex marriage or legalization of marijuana topics such as that but then there are the other side of things such as or or even you mentioned sort of having open border policies more open border policies for immigration but what about something like gun laws see then it kind of swings the other way and the more left-leaning, politically-minded individual would be far more interested in having restrictions. What about something something yeah, like it, that? It's absolutely right. I certainly take the standard libertarian view on gun control policies. I am very skeptical that they are successful in reducing violence or having other good effects, um, and I advocate for keeping guns legal. I take a kind of softer line on mild restrictions my best judgment is mild restrictions like a three-day waiting period or a background check they have minor effects the people who want to get guns but are not eligible for the background checks they go to black market dealers and they still are able to get guns but i have no great objection to those policies so long as they stay sort of modest to me the real danger is if you start restricting guns a little bit you may end up restricting them a lot. And the more and more you do it, the more you drive that market underground. And then you're back to the same situation as with prohibitions of marijuana or alcohol. You create black markets, which are violent, which create corruption, which create violence. And so I deliberately put the drug legalization literature right before the gun legalization literature, uh, lecture, I mean, because I want the students to realize the standard economic analysis you would do is very similar. If you're going to come down in favor of legalizing one but not the other, or vice, you know, reversed, you need a good reason. The natural thing is to either be pro-prohibition on both or against prohibition on both. Um, and libertarians are against prohibition for 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 both categories. Uh, so I, I haven't gotten the pushback yet. I, you know, <laughs> you never know. Every every semester, I wonder when I teach the class. <laughs> Is this going to be the time? But I don't, I would be surprised if that happened. That's really interesting. Mm -hmm. I, wa I guess another question for you is how did you survive the years 2020 to 2022 when the world kind of shut down and we had restrictions imposed on us? How would a guy like Jeffrey do with so many restrictions and in government intervention during a time period such as this? was certainly opposed to most, I don't want to say all without thinking it through completely, but the vast majority of the restrictions. I think a lot of the evidence that people have put together since that is reasonably supportive of the libertarian view. Those restrictions had some modest effects on the spread of disease, but had really big negative effects on the economy, on learning by students in schools, on the degree of isolation and depression and things like that. Um, one thing I was surprised about is that I think somewhat broadly libertarians were sort of timid in pushing back against all the restrictions in the early days. I think libertarians got 
sort of scared too, because it was scary. People were, lots of people were dying and we didn't really know how bad it was going to get. And so we kind of played it quiet for a while um, in terms of commenting on the restrictions. Whereas I had sort of hoped we would have just said instinctively, a governor getting up in front of a podium and telling everybody in his state that he was closing all the restaurants in his state, absolutely unacceptable to libertarians, okay? No matter what the threat, because at a minimum, he should get permission from the state legislature. He shouldn't be able to do that just by executive fiat. Libertarians would not be enthusiastic about the legislature closing down an industry either, but at least then there's some respect for democracy as opposed to just this centralized power in the hands of a governor or a president or whatever. Um, so, but gradually libertarians got their courage back and have spoken up against their restrictions. Jeffrey, is, is there a country that is more libertarian than the United States? There are uh, a number of groups that put together measures of freedom. Some are measures of personal freedom, some are measures of economic freedom, some are kind of aggregates. And they take data on a whole set of things. Do you outlaw drugs? Do you regulate this? Do you regulate that? Who operates the schools? Is there decentralization of this? That? And they, they are plausible measures of how free your society is. And they add these all up and they come up with an index. U.S. does not do all that well. And not terribly. We come in, I think the latest one I saw, about 20th. New Zealand typically comes out at the top of that list. Now, and roughly speaking, you know, the Western European economies, the US, Canada, come out relatively high, and some obvious countries come out super low, like North Korea or Cuba, and so and so on. But um, it's a little disappointing. And the US has been going down over the past decade or so in terms of where it is in that index. I think Canada comes out freer than the US by that measure. Okay. But it will depend that's, on that's shocking. which part of the index you look at. Um, I mean, one measure is just how big is government spending? The government spending in the US has been creeping up pretty fast, whereas Canada seems to have moderated the, at least the upward path to a reasonable degree. Um, these indices are a measure. They're not necessarily a perfect measure, but so that's what I would say. We're pretty good, but we're not obviously the best. Now, a different measure, which I would advocate is the best economy is the economy that the most people are trying to get into or the best, the country that must be the freest or the nicest in terms of all the things people care about. And by that measure, I think you would give the U.S. a pretty, pretty high marks. You'd give Canada very high marks, too, uh, by that measure. OK, Jeffrey, let's get into a subject that interests Garrett and myself quite a bit <laughs> is alcohol, maybe less so with drugs, but alcohol is a drug. So you obviously have focused a lot of your academic work on mostly drugs, but alcohol as well. Now, the United States has an interesting history with its restrictions and its prohibition with both drugs and alcohol. Obviously, the I think the 13 year period from 1920 to 1933 is kind of a great piece of evidence to support your political views, probably that a restrictive approach to a substance that is deemed bad or malevolent in some way, probably even though society is not too keen on its repercussions, having a pro having prohibition towards a substance doesn't really seem to be the best course of action. So maybe can you talk a little bit about this piece of history? We've spoken to a few individuals on prohibition. Why did that, why was that a failed piece of federal legislation? So the US history of alcohol prohibition started with state level laws in the Northeast part of the country that were mainly directed at Irish immigrants. And then there was another wave of state level laws around the 1870s, and then another wave in the 19, early 1900s and 1910s. All three waves were associated with large scale immigration from countries that were relatively heavy consumers of alcohol. So it's easy to see those waves of state level laws as the natives not liking new competition from the immigrants and in some level trying to make life less hospitable for them and maybe discourage that kind of the immigration that was 
creating competition in the labor market and, and so on. But by the early 1900s, people recognized that state level bans on alcohol or restrictions on alcohol were close to completely ineffective because states' borders are entirely porous. And the laws themselves were actually not super strict. For example, many of them allowed importation of one gallon per person per month of alcohol. That's a modern amount of alcohol that you could bring in completely legally. So people decided that federal prohibition was the only thing that might work. There was I think a lot of unhappiness over World War I and fear and more and a need for moral certainty that coincided with, uh, with World War I. And so we passed the immigration, the uh, prohibition law in 1920. Uh, pretty quickly, the violence rate started to go up in the US, corruption and other sorts of uh, evils happen. Importation, adulteration, black market smuggling, all the things you see portrayed in movies, okay, happened very quickly. And so by 1930 or so, uh, people realized that there were a lot of very obvious negative side effects. The violence also, deaths from alcohol went up dramatically, even though alcohol consumption had probably declined somewhat, not a lot, but somewhat, because people were drinking adulterated alcohol, impure alcohol, things like that. Um, then the Great Depression started, 1930, and so the government was losing lots of tax revenue. Um, and so there was a thought that, well, if we re-legalize alcohol, we can collect more in taxes and help address the budget deficit created by the Great Depression. And so those things came together with the dissatisfaction with all the violence and led to repeal, which as you said, uh, occurred at the end of 1933. Um, and US has not gone back to that since although we have focused on drug prohibition, um, which expand, which had begun before alcohol prohibition ended, but it started to expand pretty rapidly when alcohol prohibition ended because the enforcement lobby people were sort of out of a job when alcohol prohibition ended. So they started focusing on marijuana and other drugs. But Jeffrey, why would the general public go along with another set of prohibition laws when you already had a 13 year perfect case study proving that this form of prohibition doesn't work. It just creates more evils and, the, and the, the, evils of society. So why would that, that, that piece of legislation, that strategy be implemented again on all different types of, of narcotics, say, or even marijuana or hallucinogen drugs? Why? I think the, the obvious hypothesis why people were not more logically consistent is that the prohibition against drugs was directed at uh, roughly three different immigrant groups. Immigrant is not quite the right word, as you'll see in a second. First of all, the anti-opium uh, feeling that led to the Harrison Narcotic Act in 1914 was directed against Chinese immigrants. There was a lot of Chinese immigration during that period. And the very first local laws against any drug uh, were the anti-opium laws in California, clearly directed against Chinese immigrants. Then there was general fear in that period about uh, Af Black Americans migrating from the South to the North. That led to fear and they were labeled as being cocaine users. And there were these stories that claimed that when blacks took cocaine, they were impervious to bullets and other you know, lunacy like that. Um, and then the anti-marijuana policies, which didn't really get started until the 20s and early 30s, were directed against Mexicans. So on the one hand, alcohol was a substance that a pretty large fraction of the population used and was moderately comfortable with, whereas these other substances were more unusual and were associated with minority groups that were feared and or disliked. So I think that's the reason for the inconsistency. But I agree, it's an inconsistency and it's, we should have learned our lesson uh, from alcohol brothers. Well, it's interesting. I, I understand maybe initial strategies to continue prohibition against maybe these types of drugs that are not so known or, or yeah, that are not so known to, to society. They're, people are kind of by nature afraid of new things that potentially could cause danger. But I mean, we're, we're literally a hundred years past prohibition with alcohol in from when it started in the United States. And we you see 
the U.S. not really moving too much in terms of eliminating a lot of these pr prohibitive strategies towards drugs. I, I guess a little bit at the state level for marijuana, but not much more. Well, I wish I had a better answer to your question. I mean, another possible part of the answer is we're a country founded by Puritans. And some of that maybe persists. Then another possible plausible part of the story is having had prohibition for a while, we have certain sectors of the economy or of the government that basically make their living off of continuing prohibition, part of the criminal justice system because they enforce these anti-drug and other anti-vice laws, uh, but also the treatment sector, which gets a lot more customers because we force people who've tested positive for drugs in various settings to go through drug treatment, even though many of them, that's kind of silly. Yes, they were using drugs, but the drugs were not causing problems. They didn't need to go through treatments. I mean, it's, it's a U.S. disease. The initial push for any kind of a national drug prohibition law was in 1919 when the U.S. insisted, uh, sorry, the Harrison Narcotic Act was in 1914. Then in 1919, the U.S. at the Treaty of Versailles ending World War I said that every signatory country had to agree to outlaw drugs in its country before the U.S. would agree to sign the treaty. So the U.S. shoved drug prohibition on the rest of the world, which wasn't particularly interested or eager. And that continues for the most part. There's some exceptions around the world, obviously, that have big anti-drug you know, efforts, Colombia uh, is an example, but Europe has never been as enthusiastic about it as the US. Their degree of enforcement, their tolerance of quasi-legalization in the form of methadone maintenance and heroin maintenance programs and things is much higher than in the United States. Um, and so I don't have, I guess that's all I have can, can, can offer. It's a US disease that we've foisted on the rest of the world as well. I didn't know that about the Treaty of Versailles. I didn't know yeah, that that was a little caveat that was added <laughs> in. That's quite strange. Well, yeah, cool. obviously, a European country that is used as an example, and I think a lot of comparisons with the United States is Portugal, because Portugal, as far as I know, has decriminalized or legalized. I'm not sure which one. Most, most drugs right. that you would find illegal in the United States. So maybe you could talk about that, Jeffrey. What does what has been the outcome of Portugal's federal legislation and has it garnered better results than what you see in the United States? So Portugal officially decriminalized, meaning it removed most of the penalties for possession of small amounts for personal use. But it also clearly was backing away from this sort of large scale aggressive enforcement on the supply side against the traffickers that exists in the US you know, um, and to some degree in various other countries, but to a much lesser degree in most other countries. So it's also perhaps not quite the right picture to think about just Portugal. Most of Europe is not being as aggressive about enforcement. And when you're not aggressive about enforcement, markets find ways to gradually become peaceful, to develop alternative mechanisms to deal with the fact that they're not quite legal, like doctors writing far more prescriptions okay, for people. And so much of the demand and supply is accommodated through this quasi-legal medical channel. Um, and so, but the outcomes in Portugal okay, have generally been quite good. Use rates haven't changed dramatically as measured by survey data uh, at the same time number of overdoses has gone down, HIV infection rates have gone down, sort of crime has not changed in any material way if anything has gone down. Now, they weren't an especially aggressive place in the first place, okay? but they reinforced that by making more official okay, that they were just not gonna make nearly as much of our priority of drug enforcement as the US policy does. Jeffrey, how would you argue with someone who came with the argument to you saying that that if you did make all drugs legal in the United States, you would perhaps eliminate the crime that exists at the southern border. You would perhaps eliminate some other illegality surrounded in this illegal industry. 
but perhaps the having the accessibility would lead to the corruption of some moral values in society. So would would you see, I mean, I, I suspect you would argue that the rates of consumption of these drugs would probably go down. We don't really know. I guess with the Portuguese example, they did go down. Most, I think most of the drug, uh, the, the consumption of illegal drugs, I think most of it went down. Yeah. But but what would you say to individuals who think that that you would have a, a moral dilemma on the fabric of American society if you allowed the free flow of these sinful sinful substances to just be free and easy and accessible to to the American public? So I don't accept the premise that there's anything sinful or immoral about using drugs any more or less than there's anything sinful or immoral about using alcohol or consuming three pints of Ben and Jerry's ice cream or skiing double black diamonds or anything else. If you're not hurting other people, I just don't see how it's anybody else's business and that that particular choice of living your life is any better or worse okay, than tons of other choices. People do silly things, bad things under the influence of drugs at times, okay? But that's true of alcohol, that's true of bungee jumping and driving a car and using a chainsaw and all those sorts of things, okay? And um, people can perfectly legally, you know, destroy their families by betting all the family fortune using, you know, uh, one of the uh, phone apps to trade stock and lose all your money gambling, not even at the track, but in the stock market. So. I just don't see that there's any morality or sin one way or the other and causing some people to be more likely to accidentally overdose, causing more children to end up being infected, born with HIV because their mothers did IV drug use, which would happen far less frequently in a legalized market. If one's going to start labeling what's a sin, it seems to me it's immoral to have a policy which we know is going to cause harm to people who are either completely innocent, like kids in utero, or people who are certainly not guilty of anything other than indulging their desire to consume this substance, but because it's in an illegal market, they end up also harming others. So I just don't accept the premise. I mean, I, I more generally argue that I think morality is not a very useful word because everybody invokes it as a label on the things that they like and immoral on the things they don't like, but sometimes it's equal and opposite or for any given person, it's completely inconsistent. One person will say that abortion is immoral and turn around and say executing violent criminals is a good idea or, or the death penalty is a good idea or invading other countries to try to promote democracy, even though we're gonna accidentally kill a bunch of innocent civilians in the process, that it is, is the moral thing to do. So uh, even from one an individual person, so there's no immoral, it just doesn't help. We have to talk about the consequences of one policy versus another. And uh, as we've discussed, I think the consequences from prohibition are much worse than from legalization. It's almost like you have to change the preconceived notion of these things of being bad, they get like a, a bad shade on them. But how do you go about doing that? Like if you, I guess, it, you know, if you, if you could take that three or four steps back and try and change people's mentality on, you know, marijuana being bad, other drugs being bad. And, and like, I like your comparison to eating three pints of Ben and Jerry's or handling a chainsaw. <laughs> like that. I never really thought about it that way, but yeah. How do you even go that far back and change I, people's notion? on? I, I don't, I wish I had a better answer for that. I mean, I've spent the last 30 or so years of my life trying to convince people and Obviously, not much has changed, but and other people were probably have a better chance at some level because they would make arguments that are more emotionally appealing or something, whereas I'm kind of a boring, nerdy economist who focuses on logical arguments and facts and figures, and that doesn't always persuade people, but it's ammunition for some people. Some people would hear it in the way that I present it and think, oh, that's a fair point. We're not being consistent and being consistent is probably a good thing. And so maybe I should rethink my position. I hope that the fact that I apply the same perspective to guns and to heroin will get a few people to say, huh, 
this is not just a person who's clearly has the opposite political views that I do, because I agree with this person on one out of two. And so what's going on here that I disagree with them so strongly on one of these two, but agree so strongly on the other, maybe for they could conclude that I'm just crazy, but they maybe conclude that maybe their view needs some updating or some refinement. I don't have a better answer. I wish I did. I like what you said, Jeffrey, earlier on, just about, I think you just had a little, a quick little sentence about being a bit of a, of a personality. I think of, of individuals who, who are bothered and discomforted by the activities of other people. Because if say, for an example, if two individuals of the same sex want to get married, what does that have to do with anybody except those two different people or, or, I mean, if folks want to come into the United States and they want to be good citizens and they want to raise their family and work really hard, like, why do you even need a lot of restrictions to put to right. put in their way? Is it what is it? Do, have you done any study on on the actual the psychology of people that would go against these notions? What is it about people who we, we, we don't like to mind our own business? We like to know what's going on in our neighbor's house or we're very judgmental as a species. Is that is that fair to say? It may well be fair. I don't really know. There are lots of surveys and experimental studies that try to get at these kinds of issues, but they're hard to parse out because you don't quite know what people are holding constant in their minds when they answer these questions. Like a really simple example is you ask people, should the local government spare more money on public parks? You know, like 95% of people will say yes. But then you pose the question, should the government spend money, more money on local parks if it means not giving teachers a raise this coming year? And then you'll get much more divided opinion because it pushes the way you write the question pushes people to think about the trade-offs if you do it in the, in the latter way. And so it's very hard, I think, to know what it gets. I would certainly say that I think self-interest plays a role. Okay? I don't think it's a coincidence that all these groups were opposed to immigration and wanted to impose laws which were going to be particularly hostile to those particular immigrant groups. I don't think it's shocking that vice cops on the whole are in favor of vice prohibitions because that's their livelihood. So that's that's a piece of it, but I certainly accept I don't think that's the whole piece. There is something and you know maybe it's not all bad. Maybe the fact that we worry about our neighbors and what our neighbors are doing and we kind of want them to behave in a good way, that in many settings, maybe that's beneficial. Okay? Maybe when the tornado comes through and you need all your neighbors to cooperate to try to help the people who have been hurt by the tornado, it's a good thing that we're busybodies, not a bad thing. So it's complicated. I, I don't have a... I feel like there's loads of answers for that. It could be you know, self-preservation, your own safety, you know, knowing what they're doing helps you know how to react or whatever yeah it could be just like other kinds of sort of limited rationality can be good or bad i mean being forward looking okay planning for your retirement and therefore saving can obviously be a good thing but not being fully forward looking or having excessive optimism might also be a useful thing at least for a society if you have to convince a bunch of 20 year olds to dash up some hill to fight a war to defend the country if they're too rational none of them is going to do it but that might be bad for the society overall if it can't defend itself against an invasion or something like that. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the standard economic model is everybody is like an individual, rational maximizer, forward-looking, thinks about their own. And that doesn't seem to be a full, full depiction at all. Um, but it doesn't mean that the deviations from that are all bad. They may be helpful in a lot of settings, even though they're not necessarily useful in every setting. Right. I committed a sin by asking an economist a psychological question. Um, <laughs> so, Jeffrey, how long is the United States away from legalizing marijuana? I think 10 to 20 years. I think we're every couple of years during the uh, November elections, we're going to get one, two, three more states that legalize. And when you get to the point where it's 40 to 45 states that have either medicalized or fully legalized, then the tension between the federal and the state policy is going to seem extreme. And so at that point, maybe there will be progress. I mean, there is a hook there for 
the conservatives because you can tax it and raise revenue and use that as an excuse to lower other taxes that conservatives don't like. Okay, so that's one reason it might have some political viability. And you've seen that in, in the U.S. Congress, and you've certainly seen it in many state legislatures where some Republicans have gone along with it without too much fuss. Um, on the other hand, in the 1970s, 10 states legal uh, decriminalized marijuana. It looked like the pendulum was swinging toward marijuana legalization then, but then Ronald Reagan and crack cocaine and Len Bias happened, and the pendulum then swung way back in the other direction. So it's possible something's going to happen in the next 10 years that's going to you know, knock the train off the tracks. But I, th I would guess 10, 10 to 15 years. Jeffrey, can you pinpoint exactly the, the specific difference between legalization and decriminalization? So under full legalization, it would be legal to produce, distribute, sell uh, the currently illegal drugs like marijuana in the same way that people do that for coffee or for oregano or apples or any other commodity. Okay? Under decriminalization, all the laws against producing and trafficking or being in possession of large amounts remain in place which means that most of the market has to remain underground. So you still get all the negatives of the underground market. Decriminalization merely says, if your only transgression is being caught in possession of an amount that looks like personal use, you know, one marijuana joint in your pocket or less than an ounce of marijuana in your pocket, then you're given either no punishment or a modest fine like a traffic ticket, but no jail term, no arrest record or anything like that. Um, so if all you did was keep everything in place and keep the same level of enforcement on the supply side, but decriminalized, I don't think you'd see very many beneficial effects. I mean, some people would not get arrested and that would be a plus, but you would still see the black market and the violence and the corruption. But in practice, the places that have had the political will desire to decriminalize seem to also be places that end up scaling back enforcement and not and just not making the supply side a priority either. And so then you do see dis, tend to see some reduction in the violence and corruption. So I, I gather that you would feel that decriminalization would not be sufficient. Yes, yeah. it's probably better than nothing, but it's certainly not sufficient. Right. And if it ended up being a distraction from full legalization, you could almost convince yourself it was it was a bad idea, but I, I wouldn't take that position. But it's a little bit touchy. Mm -hmm. What about harder, quote, harder drugs, Jeffrey? Are those on the horizon at all of ever becoming legal in the U.S.? It doesn't look that way for opioids right now. But the opioid overdose is going up. Nobody seems open to the idea that the reason we have all those overdoses is because it's happening in a black market. Okay? But the evidence is incredibly suggestive that the problem was not the overprescribing. There may have been some overprescribing. Okay? There may have been some sort of carelessness and overaggressiveness in marketing and, and prescribing drugs, but that leveled off and reversed around 2010 in the US. Okay? number of prescriptions written per capita okay, for, op for opioids. Overdose deaths kept going up and indeed went up at a faster rate when the prescribing started going down again. And that's persisted over roughly 12 years now. Okay? That's grossly inconsistent with the view that this was an overprescribing story. It's totally suggested that when you don't prescribe, People go to the black market to get the drugs, and then they accidentally overdose because they don't know the potency they're getting, not because the drugs per se necessarily cause overdoses. People can take huge amounts of opioids for long periods of time with no obvious ill effects, and indeed with, for some of them, beneficial effects of pain relief and pain management and all that, if they are getting a known dosage, and if when they increase the dosage, they do it slowly over time, a rather than just going from almost no dose to a big dose. What about other drugs? I know psilocybin has been you know, sort of coming up strong and been very popular in the news and getting a lot of light. Yeah, the psychedelics generally, that seems to be doing a little bit better because <clears throat> there's more 
you know, evidence out there from the psychiatrist and the medical studies that it's useful in certain, uh, for certain types of conditions to prescribe those. Um, I don't think people find those nearly as threatening. Okay, heroin is just associated with so many negative things. Everybody saw the French mm -hmm. Connection and all, you know, all those sorts of bad movies, whereas very few people have much experience with, this, with the psychedelics. And there's also this new movement on the micro dosing, which is interesting. Um, yeah. Well, Jeffrey, we're coming up on our hour mark. So, of course, we want to be respectful of your time. I I'm interested. We're talking a lot about going one way in terms of restricting prohibition with certainly with marijuana, perhaps other drugs as well. Garrett and I are interested in beer, uh -huh. which is a low level alcoholic beverage. Mm -hmm. And in our, and in Canada, for example, yeah, it could be a high alcoholic <laughs> beverage. So in Canada, for example, a few months ago, a government agency came out and said that it came out with a bold kind of vague statement going against what government advisories had stated in previous years, saying that any more than two alcoholic beverages per week is considered risky. Again, kind of vague. Two and it per got a week? Lot, yeah, it got a lot of it got a lot of Canadians kind of confused because like Americans, Canadians like to drink alcohol. So <laughs> that was kind of perplexing to a lot of Canadians. Although if you really do look at alcohol, maybe in a comparative lens with perhaps say cigarettes, I think a lot of the, particularly a lot of the health effects that come along with overconsumption of alcohol, maybe other behavioral issues with drinking and driving and sexual assault, things like that. Do we see a little bit of things going in the other direction? Perhaps not to say going back to 1920 and prohibiting the sale, production, and consumption of alcohol, but maybe creating a little bit more of what we have with cigarettes, having more commercial material showing the negative health effects and other other ill ill associated behavioral aspects that go with alcohol. I don't quite feel as though I've seen that in the U.S., except in this one specific way, which is whenever I look up some health condition on the Internet and I look at what are the risk factors for this condition, it'll give a bunch of things which sort of make sense and seem to go with the condition I'm looking up. And then it will also always say cigarettes and alcohol. It's like alcohol being blamed for everything. And the medical community is sort of doing what you were hinting at that like alcohol is always bad. We definitely want to get people to consume less alcohol, but I don't feel it widely. I don't sort of feel like I hear it from the students. It's there, there is that streak. There is that public health puritanical. If it's fun and people enjoy it, it must be bad and we should stop it. Um, and it certainly applies to alcohol. All right. Interesting. It's a good, probably a good place to stop. Well, Jeffrey Myron, um, Senior Lecturer and Director of Undergraduate Studies in the Department of Economics at Harvard University and author of Drug War Crimes, The Consequences of Prohibition. I think Garrett and I have learned a lot about libertarianism, so we really appreciate that. Jeffrey, thanks for your time, and hopefully we can have you on again in the near future. Thank you very much for having me. It's really been a pleasure. Thank you. Be sure to subscribe to stay up to date on all our interviews and beer-related content. Remember, craft beer is here.